Pen commenced its first installment last 2009, a promising food writing workshop that catered to the technicalities of food writing and its arising discourses such as food blogging, the art of restaurant review, food styling, and photography, among others. This successful takeoff was followed by a series of writing workshops, now variably focusing on different trajectories, like writing about Philippine cuisine and heritage, food research, and recipe writing, and even on how to get your manuscripts published. The Power of Pen strode its glory through six more installments, bringing culinary professionals, food writers, and other enthusiasts to propel forward their goal through these various discourses. Today, we are launching a one-of-a-kind convergence through gastronomy, one nation separated geographically, but united by our burning love for culture and cuisine. To tell us more about it is the fountainhead of the Power of Pen series, its founder, and the managing director of its organizing body, let us all welcome the powerful, amazing woman behind this project, Ms. Tessa, Teresa Arroyo Terona. Hello, good morning, everyone. Are you ready for the seventh? More satisfying than seeing a concept come into fruition. And we like it when hard work pays off because it is a realization of something desired. Of all the places of the heart, or of all the places in the heart, it must be the kitchen that generates the warmest thoughts of home in more ways than one. Put another way, in the heart of our memories, there's always something cooking. What I know of food, I learned from hanging out with my mother, Consuelo, in her kitchen, of course, accompanying her to the market on weekends, helping her prepare food for a family of six, my father, my mother, and three of my siblings, sisters. Cooking sessions with my mother, who is half Chinese, half Bulacena and Spanish, were both demanding and joyful locations that make up the bulk of my memories with her. Demanding because she was extremely particular about the way ingredients were prepared, and even as a child, I was expected to be capable and obedient assistant. Of course, that she's expecting that perhaps because I was the eldest among the four girls. One thing that's stuck in my mind is this. My mom's style of cooking is deductive. She never wrote anything down or measured the ingredients. Having tasted the dish, she could parse and recreate it from memory. I would like to say that I inherited her talent for capturing and recapturing flavors. Therefore, I'm very proud to say that I also cook. Personally, I think Pinoy food is improvised food. It is food produced from discarte. There are, of course, the basic flavors to identify with. The basic, salty, sour, sweet, and beyond that, you're on your own to add what you like and use what you can find. I am telling you this side of the story so that you will fully understand why the power of pen will remain to be my most favorite concept. Because I've been in the events business since 1993. And why up until now on its seventh series, I am still thrilled about it. The other, the other reason being is my exposure to writing in 2004, when it all began. I was working for f &B World Magazine, then owned by Angels Publishing, as marketing director. And my boss then, managing director, Nana Ozaita, asked if I can write about the wines of Australia since I was flying to South Australia with my husband. I wrote a two-page article on the Barossa Valley. It was my first article. And the many different wines I get to taste and enjoy, of course, from sun up to sunset. Since then, I immersed myself to learning and developing my skills, but I was really more inclined to putting up events as I saw the need to improve food writing through education. I saw this not as one working for the magazine, but I saw it as someone trying to study how we can take advantage and learn from the senior or more experienced writers who can share their knowledge to us. After all, as Marcus Aurelius, the last of the so-called five good emperors, once said, 
Mastery of reading and writing requires a master. Still more, so like life. Finding the right subject to bring in every series of the power of pen is not an easy job for us to do. Not to mention finding the right speakers to help us carry out the objectives. So on the occasion of the seventh installation of the power of pen, we have the following objectives. Number one, to chronicle the glorious past of our nation in terms of our trade, food waste, and dishes. Number two, to address scholarly inquiries, inquiries on food, historical, cultural, behavioral, biological, and the social economic inquiries. Number three, to foster interest in the various culinary heritage in our cross regions to cultivate a community of writers, researchers, and culinary enthusiasts to help us preserve it. Number four, to promote local dishes and market from the different regions across the country. And number five, utilize our culinary heritage and impact our interaction with our ecosystem towards a sustainable environment of consumers and producers of food. To fully allow you to understand and appreciate the power of pen since the day we started, we prepared a short video material, which is a compilation of Power of Pen 2009 to 2016.
Seven series. At this point, I'd like to uh, make some special acknowledgement of some people who really took the time out of their busy schedule to be with us, and uh, because they came from far off places outside of Metro Manila. Let me acknowledge the presence of the Department of Tourism Region 1 representative, Ms. Evangeline Dada. Ma? Thank you very much to Director Martin, Val uh, Martin Valera, right? Thank you. 
Also, the representatives of the tourism organization of Quezon Province of the Philippines, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Ms. Maria Cristina Decal and Maria Carmen Marasigan. Also, but she, of course, this person is no longer outside of Manila, but I met her during one of the uh, projects I was doing for the Philippine Association of Breeders and Layers Incorporated. She's the president of the Nutritionists and Dietitians Association of the Philippines. Let us all welcome Dr. Adela Hamorabo Ruiz. Hello, Dr. Ruiz. Welcome. The Power of Pens Series 7 would be, uh, would be, of course, uh, possible without our sponsors. We have Ginebra San Miguel, GSM Blue Flavors, Massflex, Happy Leading Wines, Big Ball Pens, Lemon Square, Novotel, Manila, Saboroso Incorporated, Regent Food, our media partners, The Philippine Star, Business World, Manila Bulletin, When in Manila, Manila Speak, Update.ph. Of course, um, we cannot do this alone, and this beautiful um, auditorium by, by Bayani Han uh, Unilab was, of course, um, made possible through the help of one of the speakers, Ms. Cora Alvina of Muscat, uh, Museo of Tubo, Ms. Cora, along with Sir Edwin, of course, who's also here with us. Uh, we'd like to thank the Bayani Han Center, and of course, um, the one who will be giving the awards for the much awaited Doreen Gamboa Fernandez food writing competition, which is now headed by the Food Writers Association of the Philippines. Let us all welcome the chairman, founding chairman, Ms. Micaela Phoenix. I would like to now to thank, uh, turn the microphone over to Margot. Uh, she will now introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Congratulations again, Ms. Tana Terona, on your seventh year of Power of Pen. So, once again, welcome to Power of the Pen 7, Regional Food Convergence. Today we are very honored to have with us luminaries and experts of Philippine food studies coming from different regional backgrounds. We come together to revive and celebrate the Filipino palate and the encompassing history that accompanies it. So, I have the honor of introducing the first speaker for today. Um, it says here in my script, Ami Besa is the founder of the Ang Sariling Adin Culinary Heritage Institute in the Philippines. But you know what? To my mind, Ami Besa is the institution, right? In, in my mind, it's Doreen Fernandez, and then there was Ami Besa, right? Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> I met Ita Ami way back in 2004. At that time, um, it doesn't say it here, but she and the pioneering chef, Romy Dorotan, had a restaurant in New York called Sendrillon. I think this new generation, they're not so familiar with Sendrillon, but um, it, was, it, it was the Filipino restaurant in New York, and way before it became uso or cool to play with Filipino ingredients, they were already doing it back then. And to this day, it was so good that I still remember what I ate. Chef Rami created a paella with piruruto, and I was like, what is that? <laughs> and as far back as, as that time, when it wasn't yet, yet cool to do all the agricultural explorations, they were already doing it. After that, she authored, at the time I think she was still writing it, she authored a book entitled Memories of Philippine Kitchens, which is now on its second volume. Is there already a third? It's on its, it's, on its second? Still working on it. She, it's, she already has a second volume, and it's become quite the authority on um, Philippine cuisine. So I have the honor of uh, calling to the podium uh, our most honored speaker, uh, Ami Besa. Ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, uh, Margo, for uh, reminding me how old I am. The Dynamic Institution. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I have the honor of being the first speaker today. And I just have to say, this is such a great uh, conference. And um, the moment I saw the lineup, I was just so thrilled to be part of this lineup because everybody in this uh, in the panel is somebody I totally love and admire, even if I don't know you. But uh, anyway, uh, in case you're interested about my name, Got Marian's book. You know, so this is the tamales, which came from Mexico, although some people would say, no, that was there already. But anyway, uh, the uh, original uh, tamales from Mexico, they're made of corn and wrapped in corn husk, but the Filipinos made it into ground rice and wrapped in banana leaves, right? Okay. So that was from the Mexican Spanish galleon trade. So then this is the Chinese aspect, which is the, uh, you know, we have the noodle dish. This is just our version of uh, uh, of it. We use a coffee gata sauce instead of the usual shrimp juice. So, and then um, the next one is, um, then we have the lupia. Okay, so, um, these are just things, uh, lumpia wrappers that we played around with. That's the ube wrapper that Romy plays around with. I think he mixed uh, heirloom rice, ground rice there. And then this is a um, wrapper that we made here in Malate. It's made of, uh, Gabi flour uh, from the Dumagats, from our indigenous people. And then there were all these cosmos flowers that, that my chefs incorporated in the batter. You know. Okay, the next one is... Okay, for me, buko pai is a borrowed food that made our, we made our own from the Americans. So we had, we, those are basically my three... Of course, there, there's more than three basic uh, foreign influences, right? So the pie came from America and then we put in our book and nobody really does it. So all these things that we do now, you can't find them. You won't find them in America except in Filipino restaurants and uh, the Pansit Luglog and all the Lumpia Shanghai and all that. You're not going to find that in China. Okay. So. Uh, going back to food that was always ours, uh, for me, the, the three basic, when I was going around the Philippines, there were three cooking methods that I saw was, re uh, was represented in most regions. And these cooking methods were uh, done by all, all classes of society. So that would be the kinilaw, uh, that's our kinilaw, the tanigi kinilaw, which we put watermelon ice in and all kinds of vegetables. And then the next one is, this is our sinigang the, of Maya Maya, which is really broth and lots of vegetables. Uh, and then the next one, this is the chicken adobo in, that we did in San Juan with gata, right? So for me, the, the, those are the three basic things that I, for me, I'm just sharing with you my own analysis that the, the, what is really Filipino food and this, this triumvirate of, of three cooking methods. And they're all united by using sour ingredients, right? With adobo, vinegar, and sinigang, sour fruits, and citrus juices, and kinilaw uses all three. So, um, I, I just want to go through briefly, then I'll end. But this is uh, I, one of the, the things I've just learned recently. I remember when I first started doing Memories of Philippine Kitchens, I was just really so overwhelmed. Like, how do you, you know, it's just too rich a culture to really just pin down, right? So. It just go very personal. And then somebody said to me, well, why don't you uh, document the 
indigenous people and then my brain just exploded like oh my god that's another subject matter right um, and so i just said i i will just have to table the indigenous people as i but now that I'm here, I'm like uh, immersing myself more in, in Philippine food and culture. Uh, I just realized how important our indigenous people are because they have the most, the cleanest and the most untainted land. And, uh, and uh, the ingredients that come from them are really something that I really like to use because they're really organic and they're indigenous. They carry the flavors of our forefathers. And for me, that is my memory. Okay, so I'll just, this is the, the Dumagat are, uh, you know, um, they're all geographically located, all indigenous people. So if you say Mangya, they're from Mindoro, and you say uh, Dumagat, they're really along the Sierra Man. Right? So just, that, that, just briefly, uh, these are uh, people, just, these are just photos that somebody who deals with them. I'm, these are not my photos. Uh, just ask this Che Abrigo from Good Food Community who uh, lives with them on and off to, to learn more about their culture. You know, just one thing, um, just a, a thing that I, I want to raise, right? Like, for me, this is research that is very activist oriented because when we do research, we do something about it. We either cope with it or write with it or just do something to help create livelihoods or whatever. So uh, when good food community like Charlene Tan and uh, you know all these people decided that they wanted to work with farmers and the indigenous people, they went back to school. Uh, I mean, she she took up uh, philosophy and technology, just like Mary Hensley, uh, who was a Peace Corps volunteer, decided to go back and, and, and work with the Cordillera farmers to promote the urban rice. She went back to school and took her MBA so that she could come up with a good business plan. So it's like, you know, if you really want to do something about your environment and to help the country, you know, don't do it half-assed, <laughs> you know. So that, that's the thing that I'm learning with, like, really very inspiring people, that they take it seriously. You know, they don't go into community and say, oh, I know better than you. No, you know, you don't know anything. So when we go into these communities, we want to just learn from them and then not dictate uh, how they should live, but just like a learning process. So the, the Dumaga, there are like different uh, parts, right? Like some are live closer to the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the communities outside. And there are ones that really live deep inside that don't have much contact with outsiders. So these are the Dumagat Remontado, right? They live outside, uh, on the edges of the Sierra Madre, okay? And they, these are their their produce, the pechay, uh, pechay and bok choy. Next one. So uh, these are just very recent photos, just to show you who they are, what they do, okay? And, uh, we use their, a lot of their produce now, you know, and they're really, really good produce. So, okay, this, are, this is the giant saban, which uh, I think uh, Francis probably tasted this. Uh, they're gigantic. They're very, very different, uh, you know, like every, every type of produce you encounter, you really need to study them because you, you learn about how nature defends itself. It's, uh, the outer edges are very, very tannic, you know, so I guess to protect them from predators. Okay, the next one. Then they also have pineapples. Okay. This is another uh, community. Yeah, we, we use their native garlic, which is really great. Okay. This is bilokao. I mean, I've, I've never encountered it. It's a, another sour ingredient. Okay. Why do people keep in tabs about all the sour ingredients? Big out. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then there's another one, big out. This is a baboy that they made into a uh, humba. Okay. So they eat, uh, you know, that's how they eat honey. They have, uh, uh, what is their honey? 
Uh, they have Pukyutan, which is Dorsatan. Okay, so that's their, you know, these are the things that they're, that's in their environment, okay? And then, Sagi Ukuot, so these are all their, they have um, uh, Kadyos and, they have a lot of roots, okay? So uh, they have Kasoy and, uh, oh, this is Tigba, a fall plant, which is like their panda. Okay, and here, the next. This is how they cook their rice. They wrap it in the Tigba, and then they put it in the bamboo and steam it. Okay. So uh, this is, these are notes from Che, like, uh, grows at the edges of waterfall. I tried to eat it. It was very itchy. So it's, I guess, similar to the gabi, right? So, uh, so brown happy. <laughs> but if you cook it, the itchiness goes away. Okay. So uh, this is this is from Bangkok Kahoy, which is in this is something which is uh, our native uh, raspberry. Uh, this was taken from the Bangkok Kahoy in the Dolores Quezon, but she says it's it grows all over the Sierra Madre. Okay. So. Uh, this is another, I just put this in because of Sid Mintz, who is like, if you're really serious about anthropology, food anthropology, you should read his books. So, uh, Tasting Food, Tasting Freedom, you know, Sid just passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. Uh, the, the main premise of his book is there is no such thing as a national cuisine, only regional. So I had this long argument with him. When I first met him like 20 years ago, I said, of course not. You know, Filipino food is national cuisine, blah, blah, blah. Then uh, I met him maybe three or four years ago, just be before he passed away, and I just said, I waved the white flag. I said, you know, after 15 years of thinking about it, you're right, there's no such thing as national cuisine, just re regional food. Okay, so these are all small books. Okay, and then okay, uh, going back to cultural preference, as I said, uh, what you like is very important. That's why, you know, for the new generation, it's very important that they like our food. Because if they don't like it, you know, you know how many people still know the, the pleasures of climbing an aratilis tree and stealing the cherry, the, the aratilis food from your neighbor, right? So, okay, so this, uh, this is the dumaga, uh, black glutinous rice from San Isidro. And uh, these are native cherries. We have cherries. Okay, this is what, another thing I've learned, right? If you say cherries uh, and you distinguish it between native, uh, between western cherries, which have one big stone fruit, uh, seed in the middle, these are very small uh, seeds, like the uh, calamansi when you then, you know, like a lot of things I've learned, like, you know, <coughs> nature adapts. So this is, uh, these are cherries that grew in Asia. So that's how it is, right? And we made a jam. So all, this is a new uh, root that I discovered from the Dumada. It's called Tugi. It's very, very sticky. Reminds me of a lot of roots from the West Indian communities in Brooklyn. And of course, there's the kamote and the, the gabi, right? So we grow a lot of uh, root crops, okay? And this is a buntan, uh, uh, a, a banana, a type of banana that came out in Kapas right after Mang Pinatubo erupted. So this is a new variety that came out. That's why they call it buntan, okay? And, uh, this is Katmon, how many people know what Katmon is? This is an endangered species. Um, this I got in a rainforest, in uh, Batulao Forest in Nasugbu. So you know what a rainforest is, right? Nothing in the forest was touched by humans, right? Everything that grows in the forest just grew by na uh, naturally. So that's the Katmon, those are the seeds. It's a souring, another souring ingredient that we should not let, dis let disappear. Okay, that's a deep purple ube from Benguet. Um, and uh, sad to say, my DOST uh, contact in Benguet says that uh, ube is doing good. The supplies are doing good over there. Food security. 
That's what I. That that's one thing that hits me in the face every day. Things that I can get now, I won't get tomorrow. So because they're gone, because typhoons devastated fields, or they're just not there anymore. Okay. So this is the new uh, cover of the sec the second edition, and you, you will see the. The, the title is much bigger, and that's what I have. And you will get Margot's recipe there, or, uh, her pinuguan, right? Where you played with the tail and the the, the ears and all that. Okay, with your mom. Okay, the next one. Okay, that that's it. Okay, so um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me do this because these are the things that I've just been keeping in my brain and. Hoping I can share one day with people who really listen. Okay. See, the bow when she explains something, it just has so many layers. That's how New Yorkers think, I think. <laughs> A Philippine, Filipino New Yorker. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you all have time, let's all visit her restaurant in, in Malate. And hopefully, when Chef Rami Dorotan is here again, when is he coming back? Next year. Okay, so we have the book for 2018. <laughs> Our next speaker is um, a creator of a dining dictionary. Um, he is, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, he's a lexicographer. Can you spell that? <laughs> In 1995, he started his research for his first dictionary. The Edgy Polistico Cebuano English Dic Dictionary, combining all of his database of food words and culinary terms from his previous dictionaries. So in 2008, he successfully published the first copy of his book entitled Philippine Food, Cooking, and Dining Dictionary. So to discuss more of this, may we call on to the stage Mr. Edgy Polistico. Uh, I started. Uh I mean, my first 16 years in life was spent in Visayas before I moved to Tacloban to learn Boray. Then another 15 years there, and before I moved here. So I spent uh, the other half of my life here with the, with the Tagalog people. Yeah. And then my, my travels all over the country exposed me to a different cultures and society and all levels of life. Uh, from the hard life to the easy life, everything, I saw everything of my many travels in the country. So going back, because this is my first time, allow me to tell you something. Uh, the story behind my first published book, this is my first uh, printed book. I have so many books in the past, but they were not published for some reason. Um, because uh, I, I, I don't know how to publish them and for financially, also I was uh, not prepared. So good that I'm glad there were some problems. Uh, they, they accepted it, uh, they showed it all, everything, and finally I got this one printed. So I never expected it would go this way. Everybody would like this. I thought it was just an ordinary book that would stay themselves in the bookstore. But uh, thankfully, God, that somebody had taken note of that and see that the food uh, writers, uh, the, uh, anthropologists, historians, uh, they took notice of that, and I never expected this that it would be like this. Uh, I was also apologize this, at this time that this is my first time to talk before about uh, about the uh, uh, work. So forgive me if sometimes I am still nervous. Uh, okay, I will be talking about the uh, story behind, then about the mythologies. Uh, what, what transpired, how it transpired, how I did it, how I succeeded. And it's also know about the methodologies. And then, what were my sources and from this, how I got all these things? Uh, where did I get them? And what inspired me? And what were the, what were the uh, challenges that I encountered? And eventually, it becomes a book. So, it was in 1984, when I was still in a small town called Inupakan. You know Inupakan? Um, that is the hometown of Genesia. You know Genesia, Mamidi? 
the mother of Pani Pacquiao. We came from the same town before they moved to Junior Santos. I was there in that school, in my high school, that's my old school, the past And I was 14 years old when I, was, I, I became interested in collecting uh, Cebuano works. Why? Because our school was uh, not well equipped. If you look at the structure, it's a very poor school. I studied there. I, I had other choice. It's the only school, high school available in our place at the time. So, a well way of uh, increasing my English and my vocabulary is to collect Cebuano words and ask somebody, the teacher, my relatives, my parents, and anybody who can translate this English. So, I write them in a piece of band paper. And because uh, at the band paper at the time is very expensive, I use the mini graphic. It's, it's, it's the cheapest one. So, I write them word by word, one by one, until I got a thick compilation. But in 2000, I, 1986, when I was in Fortune, again, the, the, the children's school is very poor. Our library is uh, virtually empty. There's no such. Uh, uh, the library the, the, the is empty. Um, you can find a book, but they were dilapidated. The, the one is very precious of time. Uh, nobody touches it. So that's our library. There's nothing in there. So because we don't have book, I create the book. So uh, I came up with the idea of creating our own dictionary. So there was no dictionary until now. I found that an entry is as if one word translated to English. You can find an English entries or main word translated into Cebuano. So the problem was when we write our film writing is that. We are Cebuano speaking. We are not familiarize with this. When you, when you write something, when you say, well, how did you spend your vacation? Or how did you spend your Christmas? But I say, it's all money. It's all money. So that's, that, that, that challenges me to help my classmates and my schoolmates to improve also their vocabulary. So they always ask me, Gag, my name then was Edgar, not yet AG. <laughs> there was just a story why, do I, why it happened when I became PG. I will tell you that. Uh, okay, they ask me. So I go out, ask the research, I come back and tell them. So basically it's like that. So I'm I'm in the bridge. Then I found out that the compilation is getting bigger. Parang hinaya ko kung after my graduation, ita tapong ko lang, di ba? So what about if um, uh, is it shared to to in the future? So something like a heritage. See, I have also a sister and a brother. I want to share with them. So some people, ah, I know. I will design a dictionary. So one time, my mother, my there was a peddler uh, na nagbibit na mga libro. Nagbibit siya na, I think it was published by National Bookstore, Bautista. It's a uh, Isayan, English, and a long dictionary. A very thin dictionary. When I found it, I, I, I quickly transcribed. I reversed, I reversed the entry. I put the Cebuano first and then the English as the, as the translation or the equivalent. So it added to my already thick compilation. Then the problem is because my entries are not arranged, so there's another challenge to me. How would I rearrange them into alphabetical order? So I just leave it behind. So after passing the NCAA, thanks for the, my diligent effort of increasing recovery, I passed the NCAA. Oh, and it was really hard time for us to pass the NCE because you know NCE is this is really the way the gate for you to enter into college. So half of us never get into college. Okay. Uh, only half of us have uh, been forced to um, college study. So lucky for me, I did I, I did my uh, one by Kogilamba. <laughs> and then when I did into my college, uh, here I am. I say I was Cebuano, then I go to the Wari Wari country. I cannot go with the, with, the, with the people there because I don't understand their language. So I was confined to the library. So that's the only way. And well, I love Pera. So I was going to go to the library in the Philippine section. So when I get in there at afternoon, I get out with the library closed. So that's the only way I have to go. I have no So I have to go to the library. <laughs> so it's not only about compiling Cebuano words, that's also the start of my interest of Filipiniana. That's the start of my interest about Philippine history and cultures. I started studying, that's my, the way 
that's how I started my love of Philippines and how, uh, about Philippine culture. Because uh, in Philippines, every, everywhere you look, you always find a Filipino uh, related uh, literature. So when I finished my college, uh, I got a job in the spring place. Uh, there I am, I got, uh, I got employed in an insurance company. I was then a uh, front desk service uh, and at the same time a data encoder. And that was the first time that I got to use a computer, the, the opportunity to have a computer. And there I got the solution to my problem. Computer, they rearrange my transactions, uh, my compilation. So how did I do that? Uh, so it was an accident. One day, when I was encoding, the computer the system didn't work. So I was so scared that it might be my fault. At that time, we have no idea about computer. If you broke it, you're responsible. You know, because we always take our responsibility. We always be responsible of any problem that we will have. So before they would scold me, I tried to fix myself. And it was the accident that I discovered the source code of World Star. You know World Star? <laughs> who got who got the World Star? <laughs> that's the that's the that's the mother of in this world. Okay. And uh, there's a word processor, that's the way you write your letters. That when, you, when, you, when you make it bold, you make a command, uh, control D, like that. So it's very, very intricate. And like now that you just click uh, uh, no, uh, an icon and you have this output. And as a little bit of that, I was able to open the source code, study it, and about my CV, I was able to uh, read the, the structure and redesign it and make a program that would suit to my need. So I make a program that would automatically uh, organize my compilation. That I just enter the in anything there and do and bahala ng computer mag rearrange. So that was my first affair of programming accidentally. Okay, and then when I when I was was transferred to Manila because uh, data encoding was. Uh, uh, was, was no longer needed by the company because of automation. That's the problem with the automation. No longer encoding, so automatic na when you pay something, automatic na system will generate ng, ano, a, a report. So they don't need encoders. So I was transferred to Manila. And in Manila, I got the opportunity to write a code. So I enrolled in, I enrolled in computer school and studied database programming and a software application design. So I wrote a code and design an application, and this is my first electronic uh, 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 dictionary, digital dictionary. And I produce at least siguro more than 100 CD lang because of um, problem of money. No? So I have, I have no financial resources. Then these CDs, I give them away free everywhere I go in Mindanao and Visayas. Uh, usually, those who got this are students and librarians Six. and the police officers, the one who make a report, the person who like that. I know they will need it in their report. <laughs> you know, kawawa kasi sila, you know? They do were like me. So, I, I really understand. I can relate them because, um, I to tell you frankly also, I forgot to tell you that I was an investigator. Uh, that's my job. I go around the country because I do some investigative work. So, I'm very close to the sky and up and um, uh, for government uh, agency. Then I registered my digital dictionary and uh, my first dictionary and the CD and the National Library and I get a certificate. Next. And just that in 2001, I extracted uh, the, all the culinary food terms from my from my dictionaries. Actually, it's not only my dictionary about Cebuano. I was also, during my travels, I also started to compile words of the other ethno-linguistic uh, vocabularies. I have the uh, Tauso, the uh, Maranao, uh, what else, Magindanao. Basta, kung ano lang, no? Na, I would attempt up those two. So, sinusulat ko kung ano yung what I, I got. Then, from there, I extracted all the Food words and culinary terms. Now, see what inspired me then. It was a time when became popular ang um, culinary courses. HRM. Wala nang gusto mag nursing. Wala nang gusto mag seaman. Gusto na lang mag HRM. HRM. Now, it was at the time, 2008, 2010. 
So that inspired me to extract the book. Maybe I can help them too. I have to write. And it's the way for me to promote our, our own. No, we, we, we have an identity. We have an identity. We have our own culture and food. So sinulat ko to, then I posted, I make a website, I posted in my blog, under the name of, uh, yeah, I use the word encyclopedic, uh, Philippine Food Book and Dictionary. Because I could not think of a single or few words that would uh, cover food, cooking, and dining. So I, I always regard them as three separate uh, category in, ano, in food. When you see food and cooking, uh, they're not the same, and in dining is not the same. So, I, I named it Food Cooking and Dining Dictionary. And the one that you can see now, now that's the one that will appear in the computer, uh, is the fourth revision, the fourth revision of the dictionary. The one that's printed is the, I think it's the tenth revision. So it's more, have more entries. So it's that, it does not uh, compete with the with publication. Then in the same year, I also started uh, creating other blogs. Uh, the Philippine Food Illustrated, which is the illustrated version. And the Philippines Illustrated, that uh, where I post uh, my other interests about Philippine culture. And the city called France is about my travels and when I cover, because I was sometimes uh, invited to cover uh, food events and other activities. So, media, media, media no, uh, works. And then, And just uh, last year or the other year, uh, I created a group account in the Facebook of the same name, Philippine Food Illustrated, which uh, for me is uh, very, very, very uh, significant because of the online yeah. and uh, uh, it is uh, it's an effective way uh, for me uh, to serve as an alternative research and sharing tool. So there I found you everything. Uh, even the path is the way to find me in the online because of this. I meet a lot of uh, very significant people in my research, research the historians, the board writers, authors, uh, and anthropologists. And, and that's me. In 2008 and 2015, remember that I started posting in, uh, in 2008. My life again back to, parang nagiging, you know, I, I live a life some, somewhat like a monk. Just, uh, just to cast up because I always think the time is always running and short. Uh, I imagine if you if you write a book, a dictionary, it will evolve most of your time. So I think, baka hindi ko abutan mga matay na ako. So I, I, I really catch this time. So nagpukulong ako in my life, even when I got serious of this, kasi wala na ako oras para sa kanya, I always there. Even the way we, we eat, we dine. They were dining there, I was still there. They would bring the food me there. Parang ganun, parang akong uh, ginawa na akong sleep, no? Uh, just, uh, the sleep of the dictionary. But, but then, I expanded the entries. I started more from my other dictionaries and from other notes. And from other books also. Uh, I can already access the libraries in Metro Manila, in Cebu, and Mindanao. And finally, in 2014, I submitted my uh, draft to one bill, and it was accepted, and there I got the contract. And it was published just last year, October, and it is now distributed by National Bookstore, Power Books, and the ebook version is now available in Amazon.com. And I got a beautiful model. That's, that's my wife. Next. <laughs> um, talking about my book, uh, the features of PSCDB is that it is the first of its kind. Um, that's another bragging rights that I earned because uh, I just learned from, from the people that I met. The, um, the historians, the authors, and the, this is the first time. Even Angel told me this is the first time. And there's a special lady who told me that yes, this is the first time. I've been reading that since 1975, and that's Felix Prudente. Uh, so that that's, she inspired me really to pursue the publication. And then the entries, uh, the entries of the dictionary is both of the past and the contemporary, uh, because food uh, really evolved and they will transform. But I'm trying my best also to, to retrieve the old, the original names 
the ingredients, as much as possible, the very local one, how it's called in other dialects and other language. And it also comprises of, of at least 117 ethnolinguistic languages, involving local dialects, and the foreign that is now infused or really adapted in our, in our, in our culinary lifestyle. And it is a bridge. Uh, it is a bridge because of the limitation of the space of the pea park, unlike in, in online and in the computer that you can just put everything what you like. But in the book, we have to, we have to consider the space, uh, the number of pages, and the cost. The, because the more pages you have, you, 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 you will be spending more. And the problem now is how to market that, how to sell it. it the bigger it becomes, the more, the more it becomes unaffordable. So we design it in a way that it will be mar marketable and affordable to everybody. So we can have the paperback and a bigger page. And don't worry if it's a bridge, kasi six million naman sa laman. Parang yung turon na ano, mahigpit ang pagkatap, pagkatapal sa ano na kapya. Then the foreword, uh, as I said before, it's written by Liz, and, he, and she compared it to, there's another also bragging rights, she compared it to Laruz, but for me it's, it's less far away compared to Laruz, ano? but I really take the bragging rights. And, oh yeah, it's like a simple encyclopedia. It's not just uh, defining pula to red or something like below to circles. That, as a, that, it's it's, it's uh, as a little bit of encyclopedia, at uh, uh, Sexy Club. Then, uh, the blurbs was that of Tel Tayag and Mickey Phoenix. And I was happy that um, they liked it too, and they helped me promote the book. And it was glad that I will say that uh, the book is the mother of uh, future dictionaries of the generation to come. And for the research mythologies, uh, well, it's just like uh, if, you are, if you are just, remember when you have your thesis, you have uh, mythologies, and the more often uh, the standard of the basic ones are the quantitative and the qualitative. When we see quantitative, it's more of numbers and statistics. You have to collect something, put them together, and study them by numbers. You have to tabulate them, something like that. Well, qualitative is more of descriptive, the feelings, the emotions. You ask open and closed questions. So basically, I applied this. That's why in the next, in next, in the next page, it is a combination of quantitative and qualitative research methods. The only, the only difference in compared to your thesis is that there's no questionnaire here. I just ask them very bad questions, actual interview. And it's a, it's a ethnographic type of research, but uh, masadong academic, ano? Pro, actually, I go through this. Okay, ganun talaga and ang proseso because you have to find a system para yung entries mo will be uniform at saka ano, hindi yung tops ito ano, kung ano-ano lang nilalagay mo then the ethnography uh, largely I put on, on uh, highlights on the ethnographic aspect talagang dito ko nakatoon lagi every time I find certain food because you are not only writing about the food you are also going to know about the people behind the food the the, the astro, uh, anthropological aspect behind the food, the people, the community, why this food is being created, what inspired them, what, 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 what happened, why this food has already gone, why this food has, still exists, why the food has evolved. Because you have to consider social relations, the tradition, rituals, the test preferences, the art of currency, how the food is served, how this food, uh, the plate is designed, do we have that? Why we don't use the utensils, why we only use our hands? Something like that. And the loose and cultures taboo. You also, there is also influence of that. Or what, why, the, why the food is considered the, uh, clean and, and unclean. Especially in the Muslim in country or in region in Mindanao, that they have this halal. So, and the loose man, recently, there are already some animals that were not allowed to catch and slaughter because they are getting extinct. But although they are not now in our tables and in our market, they were once considered food, and I also included in the dictionary. Um, the other is mythologies. Uh, I not only confined on the qualitative and uh, quantitative aspect of mythologies, I also applied other mythologies depending on ano yung, ano yung, ano yung source, ano yung area. Because you have also to adjust. Because not all the time you can apply the academic, academic approach. Sometimes you have to be practical. Uh, one of those is baka yung weather condition. Yung style mo sa bundok, iba. Sa patag, iba. Sa dagat, sa ilog, iba. 
you, you cannot you cannot apply one system. You have to you have to you have to invent some time. So other under my other research, other research methodologies, I have applied. Uh, I I made some field research, the basic research method. Uh, I go to books and libraries. Uh, I I also collect some printed resources. And yeah, I also got from the mass media and the online because of that mass media technology. And of course, I cannot do it alone, so I have to make my own network. And then the first two, the one that the first. The, the first two, the field research and the basic research method, are the ones that I largely employ. And this is the next, please. Under the field research, I have to travel all over the Philippines to Ghana. You have to be there. You, you, you don't have to just to ask people what's this and imagine it yourself. You have to go there to find out, to, to, to actually see the soil specimen, the actual food, for you to understand and get all this the answer of all these questions. See, how do we how do we spill it? So you have to go there and ask them, how would you spill it? So you video paper, then you let them write and you 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 put it into uh, into your record. Then how would you pronounce it? You cannot just read in the newspaper or in, in the literature because most often these are not punctuated, these are not accented. So the pronunciation, the way the, the degree of uttering the vowels and the consonants, you cannot just realize by reading, so you have to go there and listen to them. And I always bring, and so I, every now I always carry a pen and a, and, and a pad, I just ask them there. They ask the spelling, then I put the diacritical markings, and on the other side I have my cell phone and always have my camera. Every now I'm carrying a camera, whenever I go I always bring a camera. Because this what like happened in the first speaker, I found something that is with some pictures and some, some um, descriptions. It was an opportunity. So while I was away, I also making my research. It's an ongoing. It's it's really addicting and uh, a habitual. Then you have to find out also how how uh, how their kind of foods are prepared. You cannot you cannot just imagine if your the food is being prepared by sitting here in the Manila. So you have to go there. You have to you have to watch them the actual cooking. So I've been to the many food factories, the actual food makers. Uh, houses, so you have to really have to go to the place for actual observations. Then uh, uh, you have to go there, to go to travel all over the Philippines to have the actual visual description of food. You have to see the ingredients, you have to know their names, and the cooking tools, you have to try them, you have to fill them, you have to touch them. What are the implements? What are the local names? As well as the place that people, you have, uh, you have to see the place because uh, more, more often, you will know something about the food by observing the place. Yeah, it's like, for example, you can say there's a farm, uh, there's a sea, uh, the, the people, the market, something like that. Because you are not only writing about food, you are also knowing about the anthropological aspect, the community, the relation, the social relationship, the political aspect, and how they would engage in trade and commerce. They are all always connected to food because we always eat food every day. And if we don't, if we cannot do all these activities in political or whatever religious activities, every that sorts, food is always there. So we are not only writing the food; we are writing history and culture. <coughs> Next, please. Under the basis, basic research, this is where I applied my talent and skills as an investigator. It's really about more like you are conducting an investigation. It's more of investigative work. Under the basis. I applied here to support. My documentation. So I, I interview, I talk pictures, photographs, I make audio recordings, I talk video, and of course you have to sample the ingredients in the food, you have to taste the food, you have to try the implement, you have to fill the implement, you have to feel the heat of the fire, the coldness of the water, you have to do all these things, and then most importantly, you take statements. Hindi yung kagaya sa statement ng police investigation na you make them a short statement. Here, uh, it's, it's, it's more of such as writing their names, such as let them write the uh, spelling, uh, what is it, like, something like that, uh, their address, something like that. So that's also a statement. And then uh, taking notes and quality samples, this, I mean, this is more of uh, 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 bringing proof back to to my place because you know there's something, there's something for you to know. Uh, um, 
for the main resources of information. You can see all these are in my travels. Uh, Ona is my personal experience. It's an advantage that I was born in Visayas and a multilingual. Because, you know, if you know Cebuano, if you know Ilongo, if you know Waray, the Mindanao is no longer a problem because that is a, uh, Cebuano is the lingua franca. It's the standard communication there. Tagalog could be hardly learned there. They can understand, but they can hardly uh, communicate back to you. But if you are Cebuano, if you talk to them in Cebuano or in Bugulano, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can converse, you know. They can at least try hard to, to talk back to you. But in Tagalog, I mean, Cebuanos, uh, you already know that Cebuanos are, are not comfortable with Tagalog, okay? I myself, as Cebuanos speaking, when I go to Cebu or I go to Leti or in somewhere in Mindanao, I always talk, I always use Tagalog just to reassure them how, how would they react. And I always got this reaction that parang they are uncomfortable. They get trouble of talking back to you. So, dahil nasimula ko ng Tagalog, para mapagat baka magalit sa akin, tuloy-tuloy na ako ng Tagalog. Pero I always take note of that. Parang they are not comfortable with Tagalog. But they will, they will, they will, they will understand because television and radio uh, and internet, are the medium, the standard is Filipino, not the Tagalog Filipino. So it's, basically, it's a base of Tagalog. They can understand. But they can only hard talk back to you. So if they cannot talk back to you, you will get any information. So um, going around, uh, pagbalik ko, nagbibisaya na ako. And most likely, they don't remember your face because I also changed my you know, investigation. You can, you, can, you can change your appearance. You can see that your risk guy says something like that. I employ that too. Uh, Parang, parang, ano ba, uh, tawag dito? Parang, naging mistika talaga, no? You, have, you don't have to disclose your identity, even your face. Sometimes you have to wear something to hide your, your ano. Parang ganun. Um, mahirap niya maintindihan, pero kami as investigators, we do that. Kasi we, do, we, do, we don't want to be remembered as who, what, how, how, do, how do we look like. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to make it appear that they will forget us when we leave. Okay? And then... Um, where am I? Astra uh, multilingual, and then, uh, then being uh, in, in the Metro Manila, spending half of my life until now here in Metro Manila, is an advantage that I understand the, the culture, the Tagalog culture in Luzon, um, because it is our national language and uh, standard medium of communication. So, in my many travels, going up north, the lingua franca naman doon is Tagalog. In Ilocos, in, in Palawan, something like that, in Bicol. If you know Tagalog, you can converse, they can talk back to you. So, I also speak, I, 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 ano na, uh, it's comfortable to me na magta-Tagalog na. Then, yung mga travel ko all over the Philippines, ay ito na sabi ko na kanina, na ito linguistic groups so and cultures na, na, na nakaka-encounter ko actual. No? So, you have your actual, uh, face to face, you you live with them, you live with them, you dine with them. Iba yung feeling pag nandung ka, nakasama mo sila. Kasi yung nababasa mo lang from the write-ups or the essays of uh, some authors or bloggers. Iba yung feeling talaga pag ikaw na yung nandun. Uh, you, you will know kung nagsinungaling o di alam yung nagsusulat. Okay? Then I prefer to cook. Uh, when there's a fiesta or invitation or there's a birthday, I always look for Filipino food. It's automatic na sa akin yan because you know yun talaga yung dedication to uh, Pinoy food culture. If there's a dish, I always look and find where's the Filipino food. Uh, yun know, una ko pagkainin. Yung kasi gusto ko feel how Filipino food uh, is being prepared so like mga handaan ng pwede mga fiesta. Uh, yeah, I can feel the difference kung para doon sa actual talaga. Okay. There's, 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 there, kaya sabi ko, may, uh, in one of my ratnaps, I said, ang pagkaya ng Pilipino ay minsan nakategorize into two, pambahay at saka panghandaan. And the sub-group of, of sub-classification of that is, meron namang pangmayaman saka pangmahirap. Pangmayaman is only the, the risk and afford. At pangmahirap, yung mahirap lang ang may lakas na doon na kumain. Okay? Uh, that's true, that's a fact. That's an uh, economic fact. And then, in the interviews, there's another aspect of my sources of information. You have to interview a lot of people to get information, and I did that for my book. I earned, I've been ordinary house cooks, my housewives, uh, relatives, friends, and even those I don't know. Uh, some chefs, um, in my, wherever I go to their salon, I always look for the chef and make some chats, and eventually I get, I get some tips. 
And then, nang, eh, pinakumon na yun eh. So, mga katabi ko nga nakikakain ko, diskartihan ko lang, then, eventually, hindi ko usap na kami, then, we will try about the food. Uh, mga food guys, no? Yung mga food market, night food market, just hindi ganun, no? Kasi pang mga food market, ano, just hindi uh, sells, ano, uh, there was been the Filipino food. And uh, street foods. And then, for the exhibits, I always been invited for the, uh, for the past five years, uh, I was always invited to cover a, uh, a food fair event in Sebets. Uh, and it was an opportunity for me na, na doon ako na expose kung paano na nag-evolve yung mga ano natin. Usually, ganito nangyari. Yung mga pagkain may hirap, nagiging ano na, nagiging trend na sa street food o sa night market. So, nagiging, eventually, parang nagiging humahawal sa nagiging pagkain mayaman na. Hindi po yan. Uh, isaw, only, only the poor kind of food has the guts to eat that. Uh, now it is not favorite of everybody, even the yapis and uh, even the people who are not in the sustaining did not like isaw. And it's the most uh, no, most sold uh, uh, food in, in uh, street food. You know, one na ubos no isaw. But in the past, did, did, nobody touch isaw. Sino di di jen galin yung ipo eh, di ba? Now, it's a little bit of 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 a good writers also, good promotion. Then the bit of a little The food vendors and vendors, yeah, I talk to them. They are very rich of information. And the farmers and the gardeners, yes, for the produce and the grains, the grains, uh, those uh, Amibis has talked about, about the Dumaga. And the market vendors, yeah, the market vendors, I always ask them, Anong sa dato? Anong sa dato? All of them, I will ask them, that they will be wondering, what I'm doing? Ko, ano po ako, taga-bureau fisheries, ah, hindi ko doon. And that, guys, yeah, actually, I did that. Just, just to get it more simpler to explain. Kasi kung explain po sa isa ito, research to ito, they will not understand the possibility of, I'm from the fisheries, I'm an inventory. Mas madali, so they even help me. Okay? And then, uh, for the researchers, yeah, I also exchange notes and information with field of for the researchers, historians, and some writers uh, that I made in my group account in FB. Then the printed materials, I think this already says probably you really have to also to dig printed materials because this is a repository of our uh, information, uh, books, dictionaries, uh, newspaper, magazines. Uh, one thing, <coughs> if you happen to be in a for the first time in a small town or a big town, if you are really want to know something about that town, everything about that town, try to visit the Department of Tourism if you have. If you don't have a Department of Tourism, visit, make sure to visit the MPDO, CDO, CPDD, and CPDC. What are those? These are the PD is the planning and development. M is for municipal, C is for city. Sometimes the O is an office or the D is a department and the C is a center or a city. So why? Why the planning and the development? Because this is where the government make their planning and then their research. When you see, when you make a plan and research, you have to gather data and information. So everything you want to know about the town is there. And in that book, they call municipal economic profile. That is the bio data of the book of the, uh, no, of, the, of the town. It is the profile of the town. You will get there the demographics, uh, the, what are the industries, what are the resources, what are the source of income. The topography, the kind of soil, the kind of water, and everything about the town is there. So, even the history is there. Even how many languages, how many people talk this languages, what are the religious, the religious uh, sects that are, everything that comprises the town is there. Even the history of their political, you know, uh, political history, it's in the mayors, in the past. You can find it there. That is the Bible of the town. So try to visit that. Uh, even the historians here, I, I know, they always this from the MPD, uh, MEP, uh, because this, this is where it is the best source of, uh, of searching the history of a town. Where is the name Takloban came from? Where's the Cebu town came from? You can find it here, in MEP. Most of writers, they always refer to this. And, they, and, and the problem is that they don't make a citation or uh, any uh, no, recognition, but that's really the way from I, even me, I do that. And the museums, of course, because these are the things, people of the past that were the story, the things in the past. Then the broadcasting, yeah, six factory, I also, I also resorted to that. Next. 
and they are uh, because of the modern technology that uh, the, the advancement of information technology I go through all this I also I also uh, also resource this the websites the blog social network I did this I said it already before the online application uh, the online apps and the you don't have only, I don't have only to rely on online apps and the online databases. I also have to make sure that I have the offline because not all the time, uh, lalo na, you go to the place na walang corrente, walang signal, or computers are not, uh, it's not accessed by internet. So I also have made a uh, uh, way of, uh, so I, I try to know. And remember that there was a database. It's a good thing that there are diligent people who posted uh, databases of plants, animals, appliances, uh, equipment, and uh, weapons. Yes, database are very useful in research. Uh, just, uh, just try to find out the legitimate ones. There are many databases that are And that's all. I, I think I have already exceeded my time. And you wonder why there is a map here. The map of Luzon. Um, and what are those red dots represents for? Uh, any guess? The red dots? Uh, po yung mga lugar na ko na. So, okay. yeah. So that's all, and finally, uh, thank you very much, and whatever is your relics, find it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Edgy Polistico, oh my gosh, wow. I think all of us are absolutely blown away by the work that you've done. Thank you for your dedication, for your work ethic, and for teaching us that there's more to research than Wikipedia. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's amazing, amazing work. Such an honor to meet you today. Uh, our next speaker um, is another dedicated um, heritage preservist. Um, she is um, Miss Cora Alvina. Excited to clap! Yeah. <laughs> um, she is the executive director of the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo. And for those who are not um, acquainted with her, she was the director of the National Museum of the Philippines from 2001 to 2010, and the director and then president of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila from before that, from 1990 to 2001. Previous to life as a museum worker, uh, Ma'am Alvina was the production manager of GCF Book from 1973 to 1990. This is Gilda Cordero Fernandez. Uh, yeah, yes, book, okay. During which time she also began research and writing on and photography of Philippine food and food resources. Her articles and essays on food, arts, and artists, and museological praxis have been either presented or published in the Philippines and overseas. So today, she's going to talk about her book, Batanes, A Delicate Balance. Ladies and gentlemen, warm round of applause, please, for Ms. Corazon Alvin. For all of you who've been to Batanes, I would like you to bear with me. But it is unimaginable not to fall in love with Batanes, not to be stunned by land and sea, not to be entranced by their language, not to be captivated by their openness and honesty, not to be amazed by the integrity of their life ways. And on top of all of that, if there is a place in the archipelago that hints at the island's primeval food, it has got to be Batanes. Archaeological studies bear out that the one resource central till today in community life in the Batanes was consumed at least a thousand years ago, the Arayu or the Dorado, mahi-mahi to many of us. Excavations in domestic sites in Batanes uncovered Arayu bones with marks on the bones, showing human intervention, along with earthenware pots with soot, uh, showing cooking, of course, in marine molluscan remains. To this day, land mollusks called maridad that thrive in forests, showing that Batanes used to have many, many forests 
can still be and are collected in backyard and woody areas to be consumed. While many local diets all over the archipelago manifest a shift from a root crop and yam carbohydrate staple to rice, the preferred carbohydrate staple in Batanes are uvi, which is ube, but of course they don't like the purple ones, those are for pigs. They like the very, very white, pristine uvi, and tukai, which is tugi. And they have bigger tugi than we have here in, in Metro Manila. And these are, of course, the greater and lesser yams, the size dictating the descriptive word, and bokai or kamote. We've been told that there's about at least uh, 21 varieties of komote, ranging from, uh, in color, from orange, yellow, white, and the skins also different colors, and the textures and the tastes when cooked or raw vary greatly. Basic hunting and gathering exists still in the Batanes alongside their cultivation. The ritualized fishing of Arayu or any fishing activity outside penned or raised stock is considered hunting. It is a one-person activity, this Arayu fishing. It is seasonal and the fisher is mindful of his relationship with the fish the sea and the entire ecosystem. In fact, the fishermen say that they don't catch the fish, the, chew, the fish choose to be caught by them. The Ibatan forage and gather an astonishing amount of botanicals for the table and as opportunistic snacks as they walk from point to point. You're looking at the uh, complex of uh, Arayu uh, fishing. The Botanist book is a food book, but much more, as we look at food as doors to many salient aspects of Ivatan culture, to understand its nutrition and health conditions. By the way, the death rate is only 10.5 for a period of, um, of five years. So you can see that a kamote and fish and vegetable <laughs> diet is uh, quite nutritious, and by the way, even in archaeological uh, findings to the 10th century, uh, the Ivatan was taller, uh, reckoned from the measurement of the femur and other longitudinal bones, and the, um, the teeth had no caries, they had no tooth decay. So they are, they are quite healthy. So we also looked at the words and then food as a, an entry point to the economic system it's not really cash economy. They don't have a market. Uh, they have, they're self-sustainable. They plant what they eat, and their surplus is either given to friends and relations and, uh, or safeguarded for the um, season of rain and storm when there is no harvesting or planting. Um, by the way, we met someone. This is what I say about rambling, but I have many sidebars. Um, we met someone who is originally, who was originally from Sorsogon and married into an Ibatan family. And that po at the point, at the time that we met her, she'd been there for something like 18 months. And so we were trying to, you know, figure out what sort of economy, what sort of bartering, buying that they had. And she said, Alam niyo po, Ate Cora, I've been here for 18 months. I have not spent a single centavo because everything that she and her husband and the extended family needed, they had from the backyard, from the workshop, from the sea. Anyway, we also looked at the, uh, through, the, through food, at the trajectory of its cultural development. So awareness and their insistence at sticking with the RAU fishing. Uh, those interested might want to refer to uh, the dissertation by Dr. Maria Mangahas, or you can ask me later, because in spite of the possibility of selling the dried arayu, no one sells. Not only will you be uh, socially unaccepted, but they feel that there is not pleasure, there is not achievement in selling something, as opposed to sharing it with your community. So this is all within the context of dynamic social systems, I mean, uh, food as entry points into globalization, tourism, the advent of connectivity. Yes, they have uh, internet, but very spotty. You have to go on top of a mountain, and even cell phones are the same. Food binds people. 
not only as nourishment and art. <coughs> food production, preparation, consumption give rise to food waste, traditions and rituals attendant to planting and harvesting, cooking, eating, family and community relationships. Though we tirelessly and in fact sometimes tiresomely point to unity and diversity, if one were to dig deeper into all our foods, one would find foodstuff, food preparations, cooking implements, batali de cuisine, and conventions common to a region, among people who share coastal or riverine or lowland territories, among populations speaking the same language. Please think of Kinilao, which can be found from Batanes to Pulo. There are a few examples that the Batanes can put up as an exemplar for sustainability. Say in planting their fields. There's very, very little of these flat lands. They do not possess grand tracts of lands, none of this hectarage. They have 350 square meters, 400. They don't even hit 500. So they plant on mountain slopes and in very narrow valleys. But they plant on different faces of the mountain. So that when the wind or storm comes from one direction, those that are not in the track of the wind or storm are spared. They are mindful of the importance of following, of leaving some land to regain its nutrients. One thing we confirm for ourselves about the Ibatan is that they rise to the challenges of their environment, not with resignation, but equality. <coughs> they are equal to the wind, to the storm. They are also very masino. They gather only what is good for the day or the family and friends and relations. And the surplus, as I said, is husbanded. I don't know if anyone has ever found uh, or encountered something called kwakai uh, that is tambogod. Uh, the kamote is harvested two weeks before and then kept in a cool, uh, aerated place in the kitchen that you're not supposed to touch it. You don't wash it. It's clean, you just remove the soil. But of course, every now and then, because of natural moisture in the air, it starts sprouting, you remove the sprouts. And you keep the tambobo until one month, three months, six months, and nine months. And when you cook it, it is sweet. It has a very luscious texture, a little bit like sochi, a little bit fermented, but it is a wonderful, wonderful tidbit. They are also expert in identifying what is edible from their surroundings. A kaalaman, that is the name of our museum, Museo ng Kaalaman ng Katutubo, that is passed on to the younger generations. I am sure that Yayot, Rey, Natu exist in some other mountainous or equally uh, cold areas. But since trunk gardening has been introduced and worked, and works well anyway, no one pays much attention to forage greens you're not going about to go pick out something and identify them and cook it with uh, luya and garlic, but they do. They go up to their uh, farms and find all of these greens and they just, you know, gather them and steam, boil, and serve it to family and guests such as us. Besides, there's no grocery or market in Batanes. You really can't go around shopping for your bike. But since this is a get-together, yes. since this is a get-together about writing, let me tell you how a delicate balance came to be. And at this point, I think I would like to acknowledge the originator of the concept, that the book focused on ecosystem and that be it be ordered in the way it has been with words as chapter titles. She's also my co-writer, Marianne Pastor Rosses. I'd also like to acknowledge Mr. Benjamin Yap, who is the COO of Unilab, who first put on the table that we should make a food book. His interest was in nutrition. So if you look at uh, the book, you will see the nutritional uh, elements and contents of each of uh, the basic or most important Ivatan food. Marian and I agree that many excellent food books have been written in the Philippines and we should not, could not, try to repeat, reprise, redo, write in the mode of those exemplary books and that we should find a different trajectory. This book, therefore, is, as Marian herself writes in an introductory note, is 
not a food book, but one of a specific ecosystem, one that deals with a human relationship there, with the land, the sea, and the winds, human-to-human -human relationships, and mortal and spiritual negotiations. It is our hope that this book, with this book, all of us can look at various micro-ecosystems in our country more thoughtfully. Batanes has a number of those. Mount Iraya by itself is a micro-ecosystem. Micro uh, Samtang has its own. And uh, Mahatao certainly has its own. If we are mindful of their vulnerability, then we can be sensitive in the course of individual or economic cooperative economic and political initiatives in our developmental issues. Let me tell you a story about developmental issues is coming from the late Florentino Ornedo himself. One day the national government said that Batanes must read forests. And so they had to cut down their coconales and plant hardwood trees or whatever was in vogue at the time. I think mahogany and the, uh, the melina. Okay. The next instruction came from the cultural side, which would be UNESCO and the NCCA. When you build Ibatan houses, you should only use traditional materials, cocoon roofs. At that time, the Holocunales were dead. And so they had to use iron, uh, galvanized iron. But thankfully, joyfully, today using cocoon. The Kogon Roof, according to Dr. Fahidalgo, who once a uh, Secretary of Education and also an Ibatan, lasts for 25 years. And another note about Kogon, sorry for the many sidewires. They say that the reason that storms are not so frightful in the Patanes is that they don't hear the rain. They hear the wind, but they don't hear the rain. Here in Manila and other places, you hear the rain crashing on your galvanized iron roofs. There, it is muted because they fall on Kogon and just drip. So it is not as scary as uh, storms here. They would be too numerous to name the people who made this book possible with their abundant knowledge and new standing. But I think since this is a public forum, I should acknowledge them. Foremost, of course, is Florentino Ornedo whom we had wanted to write the social part of this book. He passed away in the middle of uh, the project. Archaeologists Peter Bell, Eusebio Dizon, Victor Paz, and Armand Mijares, uh, we can't talk about the bones, either of human or uh, of, of fauna, without their assistance. Uh, zoo archaeologist Angel Bautista and zoologist Arvin Diesmans, who put us on the right track. When did the pig come to Batanes? What sort of chickens do they have? And is the cattle native to um, Matanes? Of course, the anthropologists Maria Mangahas and Ame Garong, eminent botanist Domingo Maduri, who championed uh, the Buyaboy, which makes the traditional head here. National Museum botanist Dr. Luisito Evangelista and geologist Roberto del Campo. UP Professor Fernando Siringan, who put us right about currents and tides and, and uh, marine uh, geology. And Dominicans young and old. Uh, the oldest Dominican is from Palma de Mallorca. He's 94. His name is Domingo Deniz. And he's been in Batanes for, he had been in Batanes for 40 years before he was asked to go back to UST in, in Manila. But he, he, he said that he's an island person. He wants to go back to Itbayat, which is where he was. And the Dominicans are looking at that kindly because he wants to die there and be buried there, I suppose. And we also thank all the Ibatan. They welcomed us with open arms, open hearts, and even more open kitchens. To gather our primary data, Marion and I had to put on our walking and climbing shoes again. But the pleasure of being in Batanes was matchless. Connecting. Connecting with the people, working with them, not as primary resources or interviewees, but as fellow Filipinos with knowledge we wanted to learn and learn about, their concerns, personal stories to share with a curious band of researchers, writers, a photographer, a Japanese-American photographer, and twice during our work, our principles from Unilad. With this book, 
a little bit of an advertisement. Muscat walks its talk, stays true to its vision, safeguarding and asserting the importance of kaalaman, of native knowledge residing in heritage, be it tangible or intangible. That's Muscat's mission, a museum that learns from the ancestral kututubo to sharpen our awareness of who we are as a people for ourselves and for the world. With this book, we look into the science held by the Katutubo, the social systems that have kept them flourishing, how we can research, collect, understand, safeguard, and deploy the Kaalaman to ensure dignity, to benefit from the Kaalaman, to own and live culture for the Katutubo and for us. And this Kaalaman overarches includes food studies in its widest reach and most profound depth. Cognizant of the priceless, immense body of knowledge held by our Katutubo, the museum will seek to change beliefs towards our Katutubo, the Ifugao, the Manga, the Bagobo. Muscat's vision is to be a model for ethical relations between museum practice and ancestral Katutubo communities. In the entire range of museological work, publication being one of, education, of the educational functions of museums, we were shepherded we have been shepherded by this vision throughout our research, gathering of knowledge, interpretation, and the presentation of the knowledge through the graphics and photography in our writing of the book. We commence the book with conversations with the eminent and acknowledged expert, again, Florentino Ornello, and the former Secretary of Education, Faye Dago, to find out what was considered crucial in the scene laid out on a tablescape of social cultural systems. And then we presented to them the words that would eventually make up the table of contents and the contents for their comments, their amendments, their reservations, their re recommendations for alternative Ivatan words. We started with 32 words and ended with just 20. Then research began in earnest. We left no page unturned. <coughs> We left no page unturned, no leads to persons or sources unpursued. We dulled people and nerved archivists by, by demanding to see original documents and pestered librarians, rang students here and abroad to get access to unpublished papers and dissertations. We ate everything offered to us before asking what was in the green mush. We drank palab, our photographer took at the taya, the Matao fishing boat on a cloudy day. The state university president had to give up the school kitchen for our testing. We persuaded three country cooks to show us what and how. Our project assistants weighed dried fish, measured pork cuts, described raw vegetables, timed the procedure. Then we brought all these kitchen cam to a city chef and challenged him to use Batana's resources and cooking techniques and create his own versions and concoctions. <coughs> The visuals done and the research at hand in various guises, books, Xeroxes, many notebooks with sometimes undecipherable, undecipher, undecipherable notes, especially my handwriting, recordings, all the physical material filled up an entire room. This done, as I said, we started to assign or choose our essays. This was also based on realizing, choosing, what one had in one's head from previous Batanas and Philippine food experience. Personal preference, affinity for the subject, writing style, and one another's discipline. Marion is a curator and an institutional critic. I am an anthropologist and a museologist. We wrote together. And this was a, a new found thing for both of us. We used to write our own things separately. But for this book, we wrote together, physically together, in the company or the room of references. So we had all these syrupses around us. We had kamote on the table. Uh, we had um, unusual music. We had Astro Piazzola playing. It was taken by Batanis. They, they took some gallons of pulp, which is the, their sugar cane libation, and had, it, had the gallons distilled into rum and bottled limited to 200 bottles, and given a name. The name is a precious story. The name is a precious story. We had a Batanas launch of the book for the Ibatan who would not be able to travel to Manila. The launch was set in the municipality of Mahatao, on the beach of Dura, 
where the Matau fishers set out after a ritual on the first day of Matau, Matau fishing season in March. It ends in, at the end of May, by the way. The usual program had speeches, songs, and dances from the community, and, and finally, of course, the partaking of Ivatan food. There was a glorious full moon, and it was as if destined that the moon was smiling upon this happy community and their happier guests. Hence, Ron de la Luna Dura is the name of the rock. I don't think it is available commercially. You see, are you and Uvi side by side? Uh, these are the most precious uh, food. Yes. Is there another one? Is there another one? No, uh, it's a thank you, but may I tell you, we will do this again embark on our next ecosystem. We'll go through the same procedure. A delicate balance, after all, is just one of a series of five. We have only just begun. We will see you two at the next Power of Pen. Meanwhile, we have a modest video to share with you. Thank you for your kind attention, and thank you for spending your Saturday with us.